What is up? Welcome to the Harley and Josh show. Uh, there's no Harley today, so today I'll be Harley, and over here we have Raina Van Dell oh. for the fourth time. Oh, hello! <laughs> How are you doing? But exactly right. You are like we should really sort of list it as the Harley and Josh and Rainer show. The now. Harley and Josh and sometimes Rainer show. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't quite have the same ring, but no. you know it's fine. Just just replace one of us. So today we're going to be talking about pledge music and their collapse, and where you can find help if you are having problems with the site, as well as thematic uh, a, sh- a, a, a a company I'd not heard of before, but they've just surpassed one billion demonetization free song plays for their repped artist if you're not quite sure what that means we'll talk about it later on so stick mm. around to the other side the other side of the show as well as music from radio orwell uh, joe g and earth mother beep uh, beep I'm, al- I'm, I'm allowed to say that but yeah all <laughs> wonderful music so stick around uh, so R- rainer I've, I, you know because we don't have a rainer jingle i want to just go <laughs> what'd you do boy I was about to start singing. <laughs> um, so, what? Well, uh, yeah, in the last week, I've had um, a really busy week of teaching, which I quite like actually, because uh, because it's not only uh, like getting to sort of help someone else play. I use it as practice for myself. Yeah. A, lo- a lot of the warm ups and stuff that I teach all of my students, the same warm ups I use. So, yeah, <laughs> I sort of practice the most when I've got a lot of lessons in a week. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's good. Uh, I had a, a gig with you at the weekend as well, but I'll yeah. let you talk about that a little bit more because yeah. there's one thing I am really excited to talk about, which is something I've done this week, music related, which Ooh. I haven't done for nearly three years. Oh, let's wow. see if you can guess what that might be. Um, let's say juggle with your drumsticks. <laughs> I'm not Steve Moore. <laughs> Play with your feet. No, I've actually started writing music again for the first time in oh, a long time. Noise. Yeah, I was really excited. So I just sort of lost a bit of inspiration with writing for a, a long time. Inspiration. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I picked up my uh, acoustic the other day and I started playing this riff and I thought, oh, this is cool. And then yeah. I spent the, the afternoon turning it into a song and it, it's sort of developed into a song which I'm going to pitch to East Town Pirates. Oh, great, one, yeah. One of the bands that I play in, because it doesn't really sound like something I would put out as right. like a solo thing. And I don't want to waste it because I'm really proud of it. So, I, you know, I thought I'll, I'll send it over to Ricky, see if he'll put some words on it. Yeah, I've demoed sweet. it. Are you and playing what, it on your lefty EJ200? Yeah, boy. Love that. Love it's that so nice. It's weird playing like a piratey punk song on it, though. Oh, no, it looks great. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. cool, though, man. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try and maybe write a couple others and just pitch them to Kev and Sean and Ricky and see what they think. Yeah, that's a great idea. So in terms of getting the idea down, what was your process? Um... <sighs> I just sort of, I, I came up with the parts and right. roughly recorded them on my phone right. just so then I could play stuff on top of them. You know, like mm. I'll, I'll always start with just the chords and the basic, yeah. a basic structure of the song. And then I try and write a melody on top or second guitar parts. And then when I was kind of happy with that, uh, I just opened up, I think it was Adobe Audition, something super basic mm-hmm. and just really roughly demoed it, programmed the drums, nice. played the bass in, just DI'd the bass in. And yeah, it's come out really good. That's I don't great. have lyrics or anything, but um, musically, it it, it's, it sounds like a, I might have my first ever East Ham Pirates song that oh, I've written, great. if the guys like it. Yeah, you've been wanting to do that for a while. Yeah, remember, a long time. Uh, a couple of months ago, you were just like, I'm going to write a song for them, because you've got well, it I've in, been you've in got the, the band for like five or six years now. Yeah. And yeah, but you're the drummer, so... yeah. Yeah, a lot of people think drummers aren't musicians, and I like to try and prove them <laughs> yeah, wrong. Exactly, this definitely. is my thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, that's, that's a really great uh, a great thing to have that you know songwriting under your belt, as well as being uh, a YouTube creator, as well mm. as a live a live musician, as well as a, as an educator. It's good to just have those different strings to your bow. Yeah, I mean, you did a whole video on this uh, about diversifying. You know what you do as a musician to help you make money. Oh, one hundred percent on your YouTube yeah, channel you, recently. It's hard to just rely on one source of income as a mm. musician and I think that's something we all learn not the hard way but you sort of have this fantasy when you're a teenager of making it as a big rock star and living yeah. that life um, and then you realise in the real world it's you need 2% to 2% of all the bands yeah you need to utilise all of the skills that you have so for, for me it's you know teaching uh, dr- um, 
p- playing in sort of bands like with you when you yeah. know we we get to do like function shows and stuff depping um writing for me there's so many different ways you can try and do that and yeah i made a video all about it just to try and help people and inspire people to be creative with how they make money and i've been lucky enough to recently start earning revenue elsewhere like via youtube and stuff mm. so i know the few times i've uh, been on the show to talk about it um you know i've always mentioned that i've got the youtube channel but it's only recently ticked over that it's now something i make money from which is yeah. great yeah and it's really great to just sort of like have your progression here on the show because yeah. you know i remember the first time you joined uh you'd had the youtube channel for a while and you'd been putting in the work so doing everything <laughs> you know a, a video at least each week mm-hmm. but the subs were quite low even yeah. though that the, the content was really good thanks but now that it, it, it's started to just rock it up which is, is great because yeah. you can sort of see a, a good progression for our listeners to, to see what a YouTube personality has to go through. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, it's weird because it's inspiring when you start to get the recognition, but you really shouldn't let that be what defines you. So it's really, it's, it's easy to just chase likes and chase follows to, as mm. a sen- sense of sort of self um uh, reward or whatever so yeah. you know you feel like oh well I need to get the, as most likes mm. on this as possible because then it means I'm doing something good I've never really had that because I was quite comfortable not having many subscribers mm. for me it was just about making good videos practicing my video skills yes. just doing something creative I, I, I have to stay creative or I go crazy true but it doesn't mean that now that that has become a thing. Or crazy Earth, sorry. Crazy Earth, yes, yeah. let's be honest. Mm. Um, but yeah, now that it has turned into something that's monetized, it's not changed my approach to how I'm making videos. It just means that um, it just you know that it's going to reach certain people yeah, and you can check your totally. demographic a bit that's one 100%. thing that you definitely need is to know your audience yeah. and now that you've got this uh, you've, you've actually got more of an idea of what your audience is so you can tailor yeah, it a bit more exactly because with a small audience it's hard to work out your exact demographic because yeah, it's so, so very it's disparaging but, yeah. but now Disparate. now with the sort of vast numbers that the channel's getting I can see everything so the average time that people view my channel the, the main countries that view it so just because I found out that something like 70 to 80% of all my views are from the United States, ah. I now post my videos oh, wow. at a different time to right. sort of adhere to their viewing habits yeah. rather than before I'd post it at a good time for my friends here in, in the UK. Yeah. But now I post it at a time where the people who mainly view the channel are actually going to be awake to see it. Yes. Just uh, little things like that, right? Speaking but, of uh, of a uh, of a small audience, uh, you have one audience member that has made your day this morning. Oh, it? that's ama- yeah, this is amazing. Right, so, go, 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 go on. Um, I'm not sure how uh, how familiar people are with sort of viral videos and memes that go around the internet, but there's a there's a drummer called Steve Moore, and he's sort of known on the internet as the this drummer is at the wrong gig, and he's the guy uh, he wears like a red sparkly jacket, and he's just the most like he's playing ZZ Top, ZZ isn't he? Top, and he's just playing the most sharp dressed man, sharp dressed man in the most sort of finesse way, like yeah. you can't even begin to put in words how many stick tricks and and all these elaborate moves he's doing but what makes it amazing is that he doesn't lose the beat no. at all if you close your eyes you'd think he's just playing normally yeah he's so funny and it's amazing he's one of the biggest viral sort of hits of youtube really he's been on episodes of the office uh he's been in on america like, right? in america yeah. and he's been on so many talk shows i had an email from him this morning <laughs> Basically saying, um, hey, Rainer, someone sent me one of your videos on YouTube where you discuss my drumming. And I just wanted to say thanks for like the kind words and bigging me up, uh, considering so many people online just mock what I do. And And he was like, stay in touch and stuff. And I was just a bit. Like, oh my God, this is awesome. Star spangly spangles. It was awesome, yeah. So, so I just said to him, like, no no problem, man. If you're ever in the UK, let's hook up and That's try and so cool. sort a video out. And that would be so fun if that happened, right? man. Imagine. Like, it just comes along and just does a little dep. Yeah, that would be <laughs> like so You do it like a drum off. That'd be crazy. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, uh, yeah, I don't know who'd win. Um, well, he would win in stick tricks. I'd like to think I would win <laughs> in charm. There we go. Yeah. Oh, yes. The 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 he's the, the charisma. Charisma. Uh, mm. So yeah. Um, what else have you done last week, Raina? Uh, I just want to ask. What you do? Jingles. <laughs> Uh, like I said, it's mainly just been a week of songwriting. I did some AV work as well, which I guess oh, is right. a bit music. Is that related. the Cortreas thing? Yeah, yeah, with Harley doing some like 
just doing basically building stages and doing sounds. This is another thing. It's like going back to the video you mentioned about sort of um, spreading out and u- using your skills any way you can. People forget about that side of it, the sort of tech side of being a musician. True. It's not always about being the person on stage. Sometimes someone needs to set up that stage or know how to set up a mic or <laughs> something. You know what yeah. I mean? I was having an interesting tra- chat with David Langdon from Underline the Sky. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, mate. Um, last night when we were here practising at punch studios he was here snapping some of the bands that were playing uh uh like with killer corp and stuff cool. at the smokehouse and he was sort of talking about sound engineers and he wanted to know about um it's difficult because you send tech riders beforehand mm-hmm. to festivals and you make tech riders and he was saying that the problem is half the time nobody ever reads them or so when you do get there they're kind of like yeah so what do you guys have yeah. again and you're like seriously I, I did this beforehand so i mean do you, did before this thing did you get some kind of tech rider coming to you so i think the way that it works is that um whenever this specific job happens it's for an auction company they sort of auction right. off properties um it's it's always the same setup really so you know in terms of what the the catreus um always do the sound for this auction house and they do it at say seven different venues and they have like a tech sheet that they know how to set up each venue so basically harley and i would just arrive check the tech sheet and set it up to the spec that they've asked for yeah. so the stage set up in the right place with the right bits of equipment i find that side of things really interesting i i Am I right in thinking you've done some sort of like roadie work and stuff? I love all that, man. I think that's a side of music that people, musicians especially, kind of forget about because we mainly focus on ourselves being Mm. sort of up the front and the the people that, you know, you go to watch. But it's uh, there's a lot more work that goes into any show than just Mm. the performer on stage. I got my uh, my first kind of foray into earning music, earning money from the music industry in that job. So mm-hmm. I was working at the Regent and I would be, you know, being a stage hand and doing lights and doing yeah. sound there. I mean, not properly doing the sound, but shadowing and just making sure, sure that, you know, monitors were done and things, um, which is a proper sound job. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, you know, it, it was a great little sort of insight, you know, a peek behind the curtain uh, that people just watching a show don't really get to see a lot of the time. Uh, so when you actually are seeing that, but the, the sort of the question is, um, you know, tech writers, how detailed do you think they need to be and how, um, you know, how much do you have to stress that they're followed? I think that really depends on the scale of the show. Hmm. If it's at your local pub and Hmm. the sound guys asked you ahead of time, I think that's kind of okay. Those sorts of shows are quite chill. But like you say, going to something like the region, Hmm. it would look very unprofessional if a big sort of touring band is touring the UK. Hmm. They rock up to one of the venues and and no one knows what their setup is. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because there's a lot more riding on that because there needs to be some sort of... (laughs) Riding. There needs to be some sort of like um, consistency. Obviously, all of their shows are probably set up the same. They have Hmm. the same sound, the same stage set up. I I think it's really important important to look yeah. it up so, something that's easy for me to tell when someone's read our tech spec for pirates or not is if i turn up and it's a shock to them that i'm a left-handed drummer <sighs> that's the giveaway yeah like we I, i've had it both ways so i rock up and i'll go i'll always go to the sound guy as soon yeah. as i get to a venue introduce myself and just say hi i'm rainer from east town pirates just a reminder i'm left-handed so if you want to hand swap in the mics over whatever right Legend. and i think that's a nice thing to do definitely 50% of them will say, yeah, no problem, Reyna, I've got your tech spec here, yeah. I've already got the stage hands on it. Or they'll go, oh, I didn't know he had lefty. Okay, uh, we'll have to give you an extra five minutes like, for changing yeah, over. It's, a, it's like the only acceptable prejudice left, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Left-handed people are old people. Like, it's fine to take the mickey yeah. out of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of strange. Like uh, Dave was saying, Mr. Mr. Langdon um, was saying that he, recently they played a festival and they had to actually... Um, you know, revamp their tech spec for it. And they said, okay, thanks for the tech spec, but it's not quite good enough. Uh, We need more info. Wow. And he was saying that, you know, that uh, because they they do have a very technical... set up yeah, unlike this guy they run through tracks yeah, and click and, and everything they have uh, uh, all have in-ears yeah. I believe um, so you know he said that, you know David's been a little bit more recently going like okay if it's a 15 minute changeover that's not going to do we're going to have to be at least sort of 20-23 minutes or something like this and that should be fine really mm-hmm. um, 
But uh, apparently, you know, they re- revamped this set, this tech spec for them, sent it over, and they still didn't get it right. They kind of like <laughs> they, they they started you know, Underline the Sky started their set, and the sound guys uh, apparently hadn't got any vocals coming through the the front of house speakers for the first couple songs. And it's just like, and it was a professional, That's I'm not going to name drop, That's mental. Yeah. I'm not going to name drop the festival because I don't, I don't want to lose work for them. Um, but the, I don't know, it's, it's, it was a big festival yeah. and they should have had that sorted, especially the fact that the band were on it beforehand. Yeah, 100%. Now this is not to say that, you know, that, that it's the sound guy's fault if you sound bad. It's not always the way. Yeah. But, uh, you know. That's the second time that's happened to them as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen it live. Yeah. We've seen it yeah, first hand again, like, not going to name names or anything, yeah. but. Come on, guys. But, you know, Underland Sky, great band. Check them out. Anyway, to, speaking of great bands, we're going to play you some music from Joe G now. This guy has played with Harley Cotton. Hello. Is, I know, right? He, uh, Harley's now in North Wales, so he can't be here. But we thought, as a little bit of an homage to our little friend, we're going to play some music that uh, he's played with. This is Joe G with Twisted Fable. Uh, check it out. It's on all the great places that you can find it. Uh, yeah. Enjoy, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh. That was Twisted Fable by Joe G. Love that. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. Got that real kind of dancey. <clears throat> hup, 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 hup. That oh, sounds like a great festival track. Yeah, it does, right? Yeah, it's a proper banger. So that one's available on iTunes and Spotify and all those different places. Uh, we'll link it in the old description. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about me for a second. Um, so, and, and what I done did. What did I do? Uh, some stuff, and I'm going to tell you about it. So uh, real quickly, because I want to get onto the important topics, um, but I want to give a shout out to two new promising students that I've got, uh, George and Alex, um, that I've had this week. I mean, George I've had for a little while, but they're both quite competent on their instrument. Um, but what I was going through with them, which I thought was an interesting thing to pass on to you guys, uh, was learning how to find the key of a song. And if you're mm. on a uh, guitar or bass or keyboard or anything that's got, um, you know, it's got melodic properties. Um, if you think about, you've got the musical alphabet, A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. On the guitar, that is the first 12 frets of your sixth string, right? Or your E string. And if you just literally just go through that, like, you know, listen to a song, like have it, have it playing. If you can hear one right now. Okay, there it is. And then if you just go through each note, each fret or each, uh, you know, integer of the musical alphabet and try to listen to see which one is the home key. Mm -hmm. And that will really help you to be working out songs by ear. Because I mean, that's what often what I'm doing when I'm teaching, I'll be like, okay, for the first half of the lesson, I'll focus on theory and technique. The second half of the lesson, I'll be like, right, give me a song that you want to learn how to play. And most of the time, it's quite a simple song Mm -hmm. that's got four chords. And I'll just be like, right, I'll find the home key. And then I'll figure out the, you know, the sort of the Nashville numbers from it. Um, And then, you know, and then I'll show it to them from there. And they're always like, how'd you do that? It's like, it's, it's really just down to finding that home key. Yeah. So, I think that's really interesting for you to do. Um, yeah, so uh, oh, yeah, I went through like the whole of Back in Black with George, <laughs> right? And it's great because I figured out that whole album. Well, pretty much all ACDC songs are either in A or E. Same with East Town Pirate songs. A. Sean, Moore, a Sean e. <laughs> uh, not to call out Sean or anything, but nearly every gig before a song, which starts with a big like, bow, he'll look around at Kev and be like, A or E, A or E. <laughs> and, and if Kev doesn't hear him, Sean just strums them both, <laughs> just, just to be careful. And Ricky's like, if you don't get it right, you're going to be an A and E. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, I, we, on Friday, I was at the Arcade Tavern with oh. old Rich Webb. The old rich around. Web of web. It was really good. <laughs> rich, rich, rich. Um, it was really fun because it was a pre Rod Stewart show. Not like we went back in time before Rod Stewart existed, <laughs> but he was playing at Portman Road. And we were playing a little archway outside the arcade tavern, which was great. We got a little bit of aggro from the business uh, next door because we were a bit loud. Um, and, and it was just because we started at five, and which is quite early for a. For for a Friday night gig, yeah. because the the Rod Stewart was on stage at eight, so we finished playing about half seven, um, and uh, but it was so rowdy, people were absolutely wasted. Yeah, I saw a video. I think someone put <laughs> on to you on Twitter. 
<laughs> it's hilarious, isn't it? It was like a guy, in, like a really old boy in like um, like a Rod Stewart wig. Just he would not stop trying to snatch like Rich's microphone away from him, and he was just Rich was like, "Can we finish yet?" <laughs> and um, um, but, you know that that does not representative of the whole crowd. But he like somebody just sort of thought, "All right, let's do a dirty dance, not yeah, dirty dancing moment, and do a jump and dance thing." Yeah, jumps on this old boy. He's like, "Yeah," and then just almost just collapses into the outdoor heater. It's brilliant. I was like, oh, "Health and safety." Ding, ding, ding. Find it on the Lockerbilly's Twitter. Twitter. It's amazing. Oh, it is hilarious. Um, but yeah, thanks for inviting us, Arcade Tavern. That was loads of fun. I think we'll probably do another one like that in the summer sometime. Mm. Um, I had my first ever... I had a very busy Saturday. I was a busy little boy. Um, on Saturday morning, I had my first ever sesh at uh, Bravo School of Rock, which cool. is... Um, it was, it's a rock school um, that uh, is in Stone Market at the Boys Brigade Hall. Um, we uh, start from we go from nine till twelve. That you can be uh, sort of the senior age, so from high school age as well as primary school age, um, and it's it's a really nice little setup. I'll I'll be teaching an hour lesson uh, to the seniors first, who I just had one who was Kyle had a Rick and Morty t-shirt on. Nice. Oh, no, we had AC DC t-shirt on, but last nice. time I saw him was Rick and Morty. I was like, we're gonna get on. <laughs> um, and uh, we were going through Runaway Baby. Bruno Mars, which nice. we've, we've played that yeah, one yeah. before, haven't we? Um, and uh, and the pr- the pre- the preschool kids, not primary school, the preschool primary school kids, loved the name of that track because it was "Runaway Baby," and they were like, "Oh, how difficult is it to catch a runaway baby? I don't think babies can really <laughs> run." I told Murray that, and he was like, "You put that in their heads, didn't you?" I was like. Me. Yeah, that, yeah, that does sound like something, something I would, you would say. D- yeah, go on. A <laughs> this song's called detail. "Runaway Baby," not about an actual baby. Baby, that's so. run away. That's run away. So. It's more crawl away, baby. <laughs> but you know, um, but yeah. Then uh, there's a performance section after that uh, with Diego um, and uh, going through the songs and really honing it and trying to get them to perform and stuff. And yeah, I, it, I've already got a rapport with them, which was really nice. That is nice, yeah. After that, I immediately went over to the Museum of East Anglian Life in Stone Market, mm. which uh, they've had Stowe Blues, which was a really like lovely festival that's been going on for ages. So... <laughs> Well done, boy and girls. Um, uh, Stephen Foster was helping me out with that. Well, helping them out with that one with the with sort of like uh, the emceeing and the comparing and things like this. They had a, a really great um, sort of record store there as well, just selling lots of jazz, blues, and and R and B. Well, not R and B, rhythm and blues, but R and B. As well as there was a, a, a camera real ale tent. Cool. So you know, I saw all of my band members for all about the whole set. The rest of it, they were at the bar because um, <laughs> uh, they got some free beers. Which but I, you were driving. I was driving profesh. exactly, and I had another gig. You um, did. So yeah, we played a really good set. Um, it was it was tipping it down when we first started, but luckily there was some some tent at the back for some cover, so people did have some space to to watch and listen uh, without getting absolutely soaked. Good. One of the students from Bravo came down, James. Hi, James. Um, what a legend he was! Thirteen. He's a bass player. He's already got a gig coming up at the Stone Market Museum of East Anglian Life uh, with a band that he's got. That's so cool. And he was helping me load in, load out, and he was sort of really inquisitive as to like how the setup was and you know what was going on. I love that. Yeah, I really love that attitude. It's really funny because like yeah, so he was there at Bravo with me, and I was sort of giving him some pointers. Yeah, as well as when I was playing at Stowe Blues, my guitar teacher was in the audience. Hmm. It was like a three generation thing. Yeah, it was oh, really that's weird, cute. and I was well nervous because <laughs> Mark Stewart and he's very good. Yeah, I said to him well, afterwards, I was like, makes it nervous, makes me nervous when you turn up because you'll realise I haven't been practicing. Yeah, <laughs> well enough anyway. I get like that as soon as I see another drummer that I have respect for in the audience. So any of my <laughs> drummer friends from Ipswich, if they come yeah. to my shows, I'm always like, oh god, hello James Brown. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a th- well, well, you know. um, then I rocketed up to Rendlesham after that to come and see you. Me. How are you? <laughs> um, yeah, you were. You and Murray were already there, all all ready and ready to go. Yeah. Um, there was a Rendlesham show. It was kind of like a community festival thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, your family were there. Yeah, I had a load of family there. All my Rendlesham students came out to watch. It, it was did. lovely, yeah. It was amazing, right? I, I'm teaching in Rendlesham Primary and, and Community Primary, and so you'll be in September. In September, yeah. You'll be teaching drums. Um, and, you know, I don't give jobs. 
Um, and I was uh, I was really, you know, overwhelmed by the fact there were a couple of my students there as well. It's nice, isn't it? And some <clears throat> teachers from Rendlesham that came over and just like, oh, I see why they chose you to be here. Yeah. So that was really sad. And there was a couple of them just like, I knew I recognised you from somewhere, but yeah, yeah it was weird. Um, but yeah, that was really nice because it started off a little bit like we weren't sure if they were going to get into it. Because yeah. obviously it was, you know, there were a lot of sort of dog shows and, and, and majorettes. Yeah. There was a dog and duck show before dog we duck. played. I know. Was, duck, 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 duck. Dog. Dog run. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they, you know, they warmed up to us after a while. Um, yeah, it was good. I, th- I think like all the little kids there loved it. You know, they just love an excuse to get up and dance, right? don't they? Yeah. And, and shout out to Julie who came an hour and a half from past Berry Way, sort of um, up near yeah. Cambridge here wow. that came down to watch us and have a big dance, uh, Julie and Steve. Um, and yeah, shout out to, uh, to Raina's little niece and nephew. Is it just yeah, niece? It's my niece and my sister and her boyfriend and a bunch of family I'd never met. Mad. I got there and my sister was like, here's a bunch of Rainers you've never met before. <laughs> and I was like, hello, Rainers. Amazing. Yeah, it was so nice. And the sun came out as we started playing as that well. That is so. awesome, right? Yeah. Uh, the next day we had, oh, oh it's, it's, it's auto-corrected to Noble's birthday. A noble birthday. <laughs> but it was Ben Gable's birthday, so shout out, mate. Happy birthday. That uh, was the same evening, wasn't it? Same evening, wasn't it? Sorry, yeah. yeah. So after we finished at Rendlesham, I'd had a long old day. Yeah. I was feeling a bit, uh, but I was like, oh, I want to go and have Needed a pint some now. some liquid. I'm allowed, yeah, I'm allowed to have a drink now because I'm finished gigging. So yeah, we went down to, to Cult and, and, and just had a hangout with uh, with Jamie and, and Gable. And then the next day we were all hanging out again for band practice yep. here last night, um, which was really fun. Practicing for... Web, web, web. Glastonbury. Glastonbury. <laughs> here we go. Can't wait for that. It's going to be so much fun. Um, yeah, so we rehearsed some new songs. Like, well, they're still from the 50s, but... If, it, if I ain't played it, it's new to me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so they sounded really tight. We were just yeah. sort of tightening up loads of grooves that we've played a couple of times and just making sure they're all really good. Um, yeah, and that was a really nice little productive week. It was good. I've just got to now do my invoices. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to do that. I see. I try and do them as soon as I get in from each you show. You did well. You I'm did good well. on that. I've already got all yours. So just a quick there's... question yeah. about the show. Quick, quick, quick question. Do you still do the uh, bingo card? Because <laughs> I feel like whenever I'm it. on, like the bingo card goes mental. Full, <laughs> full on. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, we'll as post long it. as I just quickly mention Copas Bar and Impila, I think someone's got <laughs> a bingo. Uh, it's Copas, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I did that to try and trigger Harley wherever he is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right, let's play some music, eh? This song is by Radio Orwell, a wonderful, wonderful band who have actually helped to start this place, the Smokehouse, and are helping local musicians. This is Stolen Sense of Wonder. This is on Spotify. Check it out, guys. Oh, yeah. Pledge Music Collapse News. UK music industry unites to support affected artists and businesses. Thematic surpasses 1 billion demonetization free song plays for repped artists. Music News! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, quick shout out to uh, to Radio Orwell, Joe and Marcus. Love those guys. And, and the rest of the band. Wonderful track. I like that one. That's available on Bandcamp, which is where I got it from. And it's on Spotify. Anyway, so uh, a group of UK-based music trade organisations and charities have launched a bid to support UK artists and businesses impacted by the collapse of the direct-to-consumer and e-commerce platform Pledge Music. Uh, we've talked about this on the show before. Mm. The collective will use an impact survey to better understand the scale of the fallout from the firm's collapse and to help coordinate assistance to those facing difficulties. Um, Andy Hopgood has has uh, thankfully said uh, on uh, our page she's she's put a bit of support up there. Um, so if you click through the link, it might be able to go give some support if you've uh, some support if uh, mm. if you're having problems. The survey uh, hosted by the Musicians Union can be accessed uh, via a link that we'll put up on our page, and it closes at 12 p.m. on Tuesday, June 25th. So as reported uh, on the show before, Pledge Music is headed into administration after it failed to find a buyer following a three-month search with estimates of what of the, what the company owes artists currently pinned at over $1 million. Just, wow. That's just what's owed to artists. Yeah. They basically just like expanded the business without 
uh, and and sort of started paying new staff and and opening up sort of new branches mm-hmm. without actually thinking about what they owe. It's bad. That is bad, isn't it? Right. The latest action is being jointly promoted by UK Music Mus- Music Managers Forum, the Musicians Union, the Association of Independent Music, Help Musician UK, PRS Foundation, and International Showcase Fund partners, including British Underground PRS Members Fund. This is all huge, right? Mm. Uh, the Music Producers Guild, the Ivory's Academy, Featured Artist Coalition music support and the BPI. I mean, so all of these people have come out uh, and, and all organisations have come out to um, uh, to sort of help the musicians that have had successful campaigns on Pledge Music but have yet to have their money paid to them. Um, you know, I had a, a Kickstarter campaign. It took a little while for the money to come through, which was quite difficult because I'd already started the project and yeah. had people to pay. But it, it wasn't three months, at least. Yeah, I, I don't understand how how a company like that can lose that money. Mm-hmm. Uh, that reminds me of when we had the recession and you'd go into a bank and be like, can I withdraw a hundred pounds of my money? Yeah. yeah, we don't have it, <laughs> but it's my money. So um, <laughs> <laughs> It's dumb, isn't it? It is, it is dumb. They're so dumb. But yeah, but like you said, it's probably just from expanding the business and the projections for the company didn't align with that. Mm-hmm. So they they probably thought, well, we can spend a million pounds of the, the customer's money because we're going to make five million next year. Yes. But they didn't. No, they really <laughs> didn't. Right. Um, yeah. So absolutely crazy. Um, there is support out there for you if this has affected you. Um, and if it has affected you, please write in. Let us know. Um, um, or yeah. you know, drop us an email, send us a comment on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, we'd really like to know how this has affected you, and you know uh, what kind of contact you've had from Pledge Music. Because I've heard there's not been a good support network built up from them, whose problem it is. So, um, so really annoying. Anyway, I think that's really interesting. Thanks to Andy Hopgood uh, for you know offering support via the Musicians Union. Um, hi, Rainer. Yes. What, what, what are you going to talk about now? So, uh, uh, yeah, our second news. bit of news is uh, about news. a company called Thematic. Um, just to quickly explain what they do. They're, who they're, are you? Who are you? They are a company that supply license-free music to people like YouTubers to use in their videos so that uh, the videos can still be monetized by the creator of the video. So, um, so for, for people that don't put stuff up on YouTube, yeah. like yourself, what... <laughs> yeah, so let me explain. So <laughs> Sorry. They're basic, uh, I'll try and explain the points as we go through them, right? So yeah. they're, sort of, uh, they're sort of bigging up the fact that they've recently surpassed a billion uh, plays on YouTube of their demonetization-free music. Now, I'll, I'll just decipher what that, what mm. that means. So, um, decipher demoni. On YouTube, for example, if you own the, the the rights to everything in the video that you're uploading, you can choose to monetize it, which is when the adverts appear, you get a cut of the revenue because you own that video. Let's say I use a song by The Clash on my video. Mm. I don't own the rights to that. YouTube can tell that I, I don't. So all of the money from that video would go to The Clash. Exactly. That's right? why we don't have the music from the show on, on our on podcast. YouTube. So yeah. people that are annoyed at that, that's why, because we Exa- get demonetized. Exactly. So companies like Thematic make deals with artists like Josh and myself so that they can um, they can give their music to YouTubers or people who create TV in a way that it won't be monetized so that they can, you know, the say, for example, I Josh uploads a license-free song to Thematic, I download it, put it on my YouTube video, I still make money from it, and it's promoting Josh. That's a, basically what mm. this company's whole deal is, right? But Rainer... How do they make money? That's exactly what we were thinking, right? So, how do thematic make money? Yeah, so I looked into this company quite a lot this morning. I did a lot of research into it because I know quite a lot about their two main competitors who are actually the sort of bigger um, people in that field. Now, it's free to sign up as so you're on the website, you're either called a creator, a stroke influencer, which is like a YouTuber, or an artist, which is the person who creates the music. It's free to join as a creator and right. it's free to join as an artist. Okay. okay. So I went to sign up as if I was a creator just to look at all the ins and outs. And it says you keep 100% of the the uh, royalties from your videos. You don't have to do a revenue cut, uh, no share with us. We don't take a cut. And I thought, oh, great. So then I thought, well, how do the bands make money? Do you have to pay them to upload your tracks? Right. So then I just started to sign up as if I was an artist. Right. Also free. <laughs> 
and also says you keep 100% of the monetization. So <laughs> how can two people keep 100% of the same revenue? It's, fi- it's 100% or 50%. Uh, <laughs> honestly, like, I wish I could somehow, like, just... I am the mind-blown emoji right now. <laughs> It, it doesn't make sense, but I, I get what they're doing. So let me just refer to this one sentence that they put in the, a lot of their press releases, okay? Uh, so let, let me just find my notes. So their main um, their main sort of the, the premise of what they do and their whole business is built around this one slogan, okay? Right. Demonetization-free licensing for content creators on platforms like YouTube in exchange for an artist and song promotion. Now, just to decipher that again, mm. that is like the digital version of someone saying, hey, Josh, can we book Lockerbillies for a gig? We can't pay you, but it's great exposure. Right, That's exposure. exactly what that is. They're saying, um, yes, you don't make money from this, but at the same time, our YouTubers who use our songs get millions of views. So, you know, yeah. is the millions of pe- people seeing your song worth not being paid? Right, because yeah. part of the small print of using this service mm. is that you have to... G- they have, like, a format of how you have to shout out the band. So when I, you put music on your thing, it's it, it's copyright-free stuff, Yeah, so right? I don't use this site. I use different sites. What sites do you use? So I either use YouTube's own creator studio, uh-huh. um, which has its own license free music, or um, I follow a couple um, producers on um, SoundCloud mm-hmm. who specifically make license free music for YouTube as long as you put their links in your description. Creative Commons thing, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Um, but there's some amazing websites similar to Thematic, but their business plan makes more sense to me. So the two biggest you've got are Epidemic Sound. Okay. I guarantee every big YouTuber you have heard of uses them okay. or Artlist, right? right? The way that these two services work is that it isn't free. You pay a monthly subscription, mm. but um, every time you download a song, a percentage gets sent to whoever uploaded it, right? So okay. I'll give the same example. You upload a song to Artlist. Okay. I have a subscription and I download it because I want to use it for my video. You then get sent a little bit of a royalty from Artlist because I've just, I don't know the figures. I, I've only been a member as a um, creator, not an artist of these websites. Five a year? Five a year. <laughs> no, that would be nice. I don't know the figures, but you can at least understand where the money's coming from and how it's mm. being paid with that. Whereas thematic, mm. I'm kind of like, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get where the money's coming from. Where's the money? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, because if, because so the ad serve thing that we get contacted by, if we've used too much of an artist's track, then uh, they'll say, we're not going to take your video down for using this song, yeah. but any ad revenue that comes through will not go to you. It will go to that artist, yeah. which I think is kind of fair enough, uh, you know, depending on how much of the song we use. If it was like five seconds and nobody actually got to enjoy it, I mean, it doesn't yeah, make there's sense. A lot, there's a lot of arguments about that, how you could have a 10 minute YouTube video with a 30 second clip of someone else's song. Mm-hmm. They get all of the money for that video. Yeah. Which doesn't, it should be a percentage thing where they say, well, we can see it's like 5% of the video. We'll take 5% of the revenue. Interesting. Because I've got videos where I specifically have used other people's songs, like when I do a drum cover. Yeah. And I'm fully happy for all of that to go to the artist because mm. I'm, it's their song, right? I'm not. I'm not changing it, and the whole video is just that song. Yeah. Whereas if I'm using, say, um, that same song in a 20 minute vlog, <laughs> you yeah. kind of feel like, well, well, 75% of this is something I've created. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd really like to know if anybody listening in has used Thematic. I mean, it's great that they've had a billion That's plays. That's amazing, yeah. Um, and so, obviously, their business plan, business model is working. I just don't understand how it's working. Um, it, it all sort of was built from this this lady, Michelle Fan, who was a... She did, uh, like, uh, makeup tutorials, and she used songs in there she gets a lot of uh, a lot of views on her channel but she was taken to court by a lot of major labels yeah and oftentimes without the artist whose music she'd used knowledge yeah um, and actually that artist backed her they said oh no no we want you to use this yeah but then the major labels like nope it's in my con it's in your contract that this shouldn't work so um so she uh, co-founded this con- company mm-hmm. thematic so it's a youtube personality yeah that his that has sort of spearheaded this and so it'd be interesting to sort of see it's you know, still, it's still it a new thing against- though isn't it so i, mean, I think maybe that's mm. why the business plan is quite unclear and we don't really understand yeah i, I couldn't even 
I couldn't find any like YouTube videos giving a rundown of how it works mm. other than the ones that were paid sponsored videos where yeah. someone's paid just to big it up. Yeah. But just doing the math, right? I've just looked this up as well. The maths. The matics. So they're saying that they've had a billion plays of their songs and that's for 20,000 unique songs, okay? So they've got 20,000 20, songs in their songs, library. 20,000 No, they've got more than that. But these right. 20,000 songs is what's caused the 1 billion views. <gasps> right, okay, yeah. So if that was evenly spread, that's 50,000 views per track, right? Okay, Would Matt. you be willing to let someone say, you, I'll use your track for free because 50,000 people are going to see it and I have to say your band name and the song name in the video? Right, yeah, because I know So that- then we're saying you're not getting paid, but... Like, how much would it pay to promote something to 50,000 people on, like, I don't yeah. know, Facebook or something? Yeah, true. And, yeah, how much do you have to have to spend? Uh, it makes a bit of sense, because I, I know that sort of Aussie Man Reviews, he puts up, like, he'll, he'll put up at the bottom of the uh, uh, of the, the video, like, what band's playing. Yeah. And sometimes he'll stop talking just to play the song. Yeah. And he uses it as a bit of, like, oh, I've just been listening to this band. It's great. Yeah. I have a listen, um, which I, I like that he does that. Uh, but I'm also seeing the sort of the business side of it that he might just be like, okay, the kind of YouTube, uh, you know, sort of B-roll stuff that they've mm-hmm. given me isn't stuff that I like. So anyway, right, we're getting off topic because I would like to talk about our next topic. Woke up this morning. <laughs> well, I think about it this morning. <laughs> I had a thought about holograms <laughs> holograms so Neil Cameron actually gave me the idea for this from Felix Stowe Radio thank you Neil he's had me on his show before um, Roy uh, Orbison and Buddy Holly are touring this year in hologram form uh, he asks so far there are a number of other artists estates also sign up for future hologram performances is this the future of music so uh, I've got a couple things here. It began in April 2012 when a virtual Tupac Shakur took the stage at Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival along with Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre on stage with him. Um, other artists that have been in this are Billie Holiday, Ronnie James Dio, Michael Jackson, uh, ODB from Wu-Tang Clan. He's up He's up next. Easy e uh, Lisa Left Eye from uh, TLC. Uh, one of the biggest pop stars in Japan, Hatsune Miku, isn't actually a real person. She's in a digitally... There's a quote here. She's a digitally synthesised voice encapsulated in a crowdsourced humanoid persona. Words. Uh, (laughs) Don't assume her gender. (laughs) Um, So we'll talk about that. Also, uh, Bruce Lee has been used in adverts with the whole face swap thing, as well as... um, Audrey Hepburn is in a Galaxy advert. Yeah, that's right. So... um, Here's the sort of the question. Well, a couple questions I've got here. Um, who has the final say on who uses that? Because I know they've been gone to the, f- the family members, but it's not as if in their will they've been like, if in the future there's some technology that can take me on tour when I'm dead, <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But I guess once once you are... You look like a crazy person, wouldn't you? Yeah, one, one, once you have passed away, your, your estate gets... It does move on, doesn't it? A bit mm. like how... Um, the only example I can think of isn't one I'm proud to talk about, really. But like Michael Jackson's estate is now sort of run by the rest of his family. He's bad. So I'm, yeah, so I'm pretty sure they have a say. They, they would be the ones who make that decision. But because we now have this technology, I wouldn't be surprised if all of the current people who are like the biggest artists, you know, like your Ed Sheeran's and everyone, mm. I wouldn't be surprised if their labels start saying, by the way, because this is now a thing. If you die, can we do this? Because right, yeah. because bunts, though. because bunts, because Five all that year. money. Yeah, right. Um, um, what? So here's a question: What do you think it would be like to be in the band for a hologram? Because Michael Jackson, uh, his likeness was used at an award ceremony recently, and he had a big band on stage with him. He had dancers, uh, well, him being in quote marks. What do you think it, it must be? Very robotic to have to work to a click. Yeah, the whole show is so rehearsed that it is not different every single time. Yeah, so. Um even like the talking between songs is going to be somehow timed. So every show is going to be identical. If they even talk between the songs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you say, the whole thing will definitely be to a click. The the lack of like communication with the, the singer or the rest yeah. of the band, that's not really, that's going to be something that's taken away because it, 
there'll just be a screen on the back yeah. in between songs just saying buffering like between each song. I wouldn't be surprised if um, a lot of the people who do this do it in the way that the gorillas do where they're behind the screen uh, and yeah. you don't actually see the people playing you just mm. see the animation of the band animation yeah interesting um, a kind of thing here is that it gets they can get used without their kind of consent as to what their morals were before Bruce Lee was used in a whiskey commercial although he was against drinking. Yeah, that's not cool. His daughter, um, you know, said it was fine, but his fans were like, hey, he was against drinking, so he would not be all right with that. Yeah. And, you know, Audrey Hepburn, did she like Galaxy? I don't think it existed when she I'm sure she liked chocolate. Yeah, but I mean, you know. Um, so the artists don't have a choice. Um, shouldn't we just sort of let them go once they die? Yeah, I do feel like there's two sides to this. There's one side which is like people who might want to be like, they're my favourite artist of all time. I never got a chance to see them before they pass, so this is sort of my chance. Yeah. But then the other side of the coin is that you're kind of killing their legacy. Yeah, and you're killing the music industry because uh, artists that are up and coming, That I mean, this these are $200 at least for these tickets yeah. for these things. Um, and somebody said they saw Roy Orbison, and, and, and at the end of the show, they're like, more, more. Uh, encore no, does and obviously he, yeah exactly he's not <laughs> interacting so you know you're kind of using it. I don't quite understand whether it's going to be uh, it is going to be the future of big stadium stuff but not at our level at it, the moment I can actually I'm scared that I can see a point where big bands who aren't dead will do that instead of going on a world tour so they can just stay at home <laughs> yeah. yeah kind of like um, MF Doom when he would just get right. put somebody else in the mask yeah and he would just be like yeah screw it, I'm staying home um, but anyway yeah like let's move on because I think that's kind of how the robots are going to kill us Deadly. let's talk about what's going on eh um, before we do big shout out to Harmless Crossfire yeah, they won a rock and roll battle of the bands on Saturday at Stone Market. So well done, guys. Well done. Um, Rob Lewis asks: uh, Justin Bieber has challenged Tom Cruise to a cage fight. I'd pay to see that. You definitely would. <laughs> Me and Tom McCarthy would yeah. be there, like, like as if we're watching WrestleMania, loving it. <laughs> we said, "Who's taller?" I think Biebs is probably about six foot. <laughs> So you just imagine Beaver just jumping off the top of the so cage with a chair. So he's about a foot taller than a... <laughs> Taking Tom Cruise through a through a, a, a table. table yeah. And like it would be like the Mummy film where they only had Tom Cruise's mic on and no sound effects. Which would be like... <laughs> if they arrange it as a table, ladder and chairs match, I'd pay through the roof. Definitely would. Anyway, right. So quick shout out to all the gigs going on. I'm playing this Friday at the Salutation with Hoppy and the Hopefuls. Nice. Our first time there. So that'll be loads of fun, Friday the 14th. Uh, who we played earlier, Joe G, uh, is going to be supported by Dusky Sunday, the wonderful dyes of Heather and Sam. They're going to be at the Three Wise Monkeys in Ipswich this Saturday the 15th at 10 o'clock. Soap Your Auntie, hello Oscar, uh, yeah. Andrew, they're going to be playing at uh, on Saturday 15th at the Kingfisher in Ipswich. That's in Chantry, I believe. Uh, it'll be a rum I'll do. Uh, Goldbloom, Swimsuit Competition and the marvellous Radio Orwell, who we played earlier, are going to be playing Saturday 15th here at the Smokehouse at 7.30. Tickets are going to be available on their Facebook, so check that out. Sunday, big shout out. <laughs> Icebreakers. Yeah. June session. That's Rob's. Uh, this Sunday 16th, what does it start? At three o'clock, is it? Or is it two o'clock? Do you remember? Because you two, hosted, Yeah, you? I hosted the one last time. It's uh, 2.30 till 5. 2.30 till 5. So, yeah, if you've got some under-18 music extraordinaires, mm. take them along, because this could be their first ever sort of gateway when they're hooked. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, this sounds like we shouldn't be <laughs> promoting this to young children. It's a gateway drug is being on stage, because <laughs> you'll be hooked for the rest of your life. Um, don't forget, everybody, Sunday is Father's Day. Hmm, dad. Um, MJ Soul is playing at the Mariners. Um, he's going to be there in the afternoon as a little Father's Day thing. So if you like your funk and soul, he's going to be there by himself on Sunday. Um, some punk, though, this Sunday, if your dad is a massive punker punker. He is... Uh, so take him along to Melisma, the Domestics, and Massacre. Melisma are from Greece, I believe. Domestics are from East Anglia, and Massacre are from East Anglia as well. That's this Sunday at the Smokehouse. And That'd also, the last one I've got here, mm, um, Flat Matt, Ellie, and me, 
who are a band uh, from Ipswich, just a bunch of friends that like to play music. They're playing at the, the Steamboat with Ellen Ferry, the girl oh, in the cool. hat. Oh, cool, girl in the hat. Exactly. I was hoping to play some of her music, but she doesn't have anything up yet, so please uh. put something up, Ellen. Uh, that's this Sunday at three o'clock at the Steamboat Tavern. Um, but yeah, I want to say a big, 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 big... What? I mean, thanks <laughs> to Raina Van Dale for joining us. No problem. <sighs> Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, my hands are cold. Um, yeah, that was. it was really fun to have you on. Uh, it's always good to get your two cents, ain't for me, on uh, on these... In, on Branding. These, yeah, exactly. A bit of impilo. Um, yeah, just on these kind of issues, because coming from that creator and, and, and sort of... Um, sort of provider uh, aspects of the music industry that a lot of people um, aren't seeing as part of the industry, Mm -hmm. you know, YouTube creators. Um, People just seem to think, all right, songwriters, performers, and then technicians and managers, you know, they'll think of those kind of four, that the industry, the, you know, you know, backstage uh, songwriter or performer. Yeah. And then uh, not enough people are looking at it. Okay. And content provider. Sure. Um, and, and there's also hard fighting against the, the sort of stigma and stereotype of YouTubers, like um, just being not very nice. And it's just yeah. like how, you know, and also 1% people see- of the platform have ruined it for the other 99% for yeah. people who, for people who aren't massive consumers of YouTube. Yeah. You kind of only know about the people who are famous for being, not very nice yeah. people on YouTube, and also who's who's like not PewDiePie, the other one, like the most famous Logan Paul. Logan Paul. I mean, he's a douche. Uh, so if I can say that, but he's on. You know, he's what is he good at? Having abs. He's he's good at. He's like the king of clickbait. Right. Yeah. So I think that's what people look at as a YouTube personality, not. A, an educator and somebody who is giving industry inside points. So, mm. you know, keep that going, brother. Um, anyway, so before we go, I want to play some music by a wonderful band that have been going for a long, old time. Stephen Kendall, who used to book all the music at the Swan, mm. uh, and a good friend of mine, uh, used to be the drummer for these guys. Rick Baylor came along to one of our gigs up in Stutton the other day so it was really nice to, uh, to meet him finally uh, the guitarist this is Earth Mother Beep um, I'll start it off for you they're pretty amazing they are going to be playing this weekend um, at in Berry at the Hunter Club this Saturday so check them out thanks for listening bye bye <laughs>